In order for you to figure out who I am, I'm going to give you some clues. First, let your mind drift and imagine the Depression and the golden era of Hollywood. The Hollywood studio system was established and they were all powerful and they controlled the production, distribution, and exhibition of movies. But more about me. First, let's start at the beginning of my life. I was born Elda Furry and raised in the small rural town of Altoona, Pennsylvania. I left the small rural town existence at a young age to move to New York, kicked off the small town dust from my heels and never looked back. My upbringing, while I left it for the bright lights, never left me. My love for America was influenced by my early years, and it was the source of connection to my future audience. It was also in this stage that I developed my lifelong love and trademark of wearing hats. I received attention like I never had before with a hat on my head, and with my hats and what little money I had, I ran away to New York, never to come back. I was a dancer and worked on the stages and films in New York. I married a man much older than me who had been married four times prior in 1913. I was making $1,000 a week, a much higher salary than he, and the idea that his wife earned more money than him was an issue of contention between the two of us. A divorce followed, and in 1922, I moved to Los Angeles, California to work in films. I worked steadily as an actor until the Depression. The Depression hit Hollywood hard. I struggled to make ends meet. Acting roles dried up, and I did many things to supplement my income, including real estate and running for public office. Politics were never far from my interests, and I was a fervent Republican. My face was widely recognized, and I had connections in many places. After the Depression was over, Hollywood and the movie industry slowly rebounded, leading to what many call the golden era of Hollywood. My career as an actor by then pretty much was washed up. I had been around too long in the acting business. I was older than most young starlets, and roles were limited for older women. Not so different from today, but then it was even worse. Too young to be a matron, too old to be a love interest, it was an uncomfortable place to be in. I still had my connections and I still hobnobbed with the rich and powerful. During my years in Hollywood, I developed a reputation for knowing the ins and outs and all the dirt on Hollywood insiders. I had been around long enough that I knew the lowdown on the stars. I was offered a newspaper gossip column to share my knowledge with the American public. The Los Angeles Times picked up my column in 1938 and I had the start of my second career. My job was to dish the dirt up to my audience, although I initially called a rival columnist Luella Parsons a friend. That changed it ta over time, and we were eventually rivals. We competed for dirt and dishing scoop to rival pa pa papers. Luella had the reputation for being kind and gushing with her readers. However, I developed a hard-boiled edge, and I wrote my column as I played my roles. I was used to being the caddy character. Once this public persona combined with my acid wit, my success was born and I was on my way. In fact, I later joked the title of my memoir should be Malice and Wonderland, and I called my mansion the house that fear built, as people were terrified of what I could or would write about them. When I was asked why I wrote such cruel things, my famous response was, bitchery, dear, sheer bitchery. This sums up mine and Luella's differences pretty well. The American public couldn't get enough. I learned a lifelong lesson that being nice doesn't sell. As time wore on, I could make or break careers with a swipe of my pen. Heads of studios, stars, and various insiders try not to anger me. Looking back now, we can talk about the public and pri private spheres, but then we had no words for these things. Gossip had been stated to mean this talk of private things. Gossip was viewed to be the intimate private domain of women, and my column was written towards them. I helped bl blur the line between public and private talk as the personal and political were the main fodder for my column. And I had the validity with readers because of my acting background and insider knowledge more than any other gossip columnist. Luella and I helped reframe the way audiences, gauges, and audiences get engaged with celebrity culture. Private became public and I scooped the dirt on Hollywood with glee. Facts became less important and the shared negotiation of the commentary became significant. Regardless of what the dirt was to be true, as long as it was sensational, it made headlines. I was influential in the Red Scare, and my issues with communism and support of the Senator McCarthy's House of Un-American Activities helped end the career of many on the blacklist in Hollywood. One could say I helped create the blacklist in Hollywood, and I pursued anyone that I could accuse of having red sympathies. Pinkos and Reds were some of the kinder labelers I had for those who had suspected tie to the communists, and I eventually targeted those with liberal and democratic views as well. I like to think of myself as a moral crusader for America, and I zealously pursued perceived immorality or a liberal slant with a vengeance. 
Things were different in those days for women. Women stayed home and worked. I realized in the day after my marriage, there was nothing wrong with a woman working. The contention in my own home led me to defend this belief in my later columns. A few rich and powerful men dominated Hollywood in those early days. From studio directors to studio heads, they could use women terribly and with impunity. Actresses were held to the casting couch if they wanted success. If you want to give a, get ahead, you have to give a little. Young actresses have long been pressured to exchange sexual favors for roles and opportunities, and this has long been an established tradition in the Hollywood studio system. The casting couch is a well-known rite of passage in Hollywood, although I won't say if I got caught up in it or not. Even though I had large, harsh views of liberalism and journalism, communism, I also heralded and defended a woman's right to work. In my work, I could level the playing field for men and women by keeping men in line as much as women. No one is immune from my pen, and I targeted men with as much ferocity as the I did loose women. Between morality, gossip, and politics, I had a lot to say. You can still hear my echoes in the gossip columns and websites today. No one take Lu takes Luella's tone anymore. It doesn't stimulate us enough to be nice. Smut is what the Americans want, and that's what my dirt has evolved into. There are plenty of my descendants that deliver dirt with a hard edge, and TMZ and Perez Holdens are just a few of my descendants. They learned a few tricks of my trade, made some changes, and now they, along with many others, keep us enthralled with the latest updates on public figures. TMZ and Perez are different in ways, but namely for me because while I reported on the, while I reported on this Hollywood studio system, I was also heavily invested with it. I also got many of my scoops from publicity agents employed by studios themselves. And while I could be catty and snarky, I did operate within certain parameters. With the Paramount decision, studios wonder want some changes. Charlie Chaplin, that commie, was part of the independent United Artists, so I can pursue him with as much as I wanted. My treatment of Charlie today was kids play, because with the advent of photojournalism, Americans then wanted pictures dished along with their dirt. A picture is, after all, worth a thousand words. We want to know, keep up with the Kardashians, even as there are plenty who will feed our desire to know the celebrity gossip. They still bring me up in movies. Trumbo was a recent movie about the Hollywood blacklist and an example of how they tried to make me look bad and the communists look good. My battle with Charlie Chaplin, my voracious hatred of him, looks like child's play compared to some of these modern day feuds. Kanye West and Taylor Swift, that's a joke looking at how I could attack. They call me nasty and still do, but where would we be without my bitchery?